Hello, everybody, and welcome to another stream of Dome to Home, our summer series. Uh, thanks for hanging on there for a second. We had a little bit of technical uh, difficulties with our system earlier, but we uh, got it all figured out and we are ready to rock. Um, my name is Jeremy. As some of you, have, if you've been watching, following this series, you might know by now. Uh, I work at Fist Planetarium as a navigator and an outreach presenter. And above me today is uh, Sophie. Hello. I'm Sophie Adams. I am also an undergraduate, or I guess I am an undergraduate here in the engineering school at CU. I also work at Fisk. Um, I'm a presenter and a production artist here. I've been taking pictures of the night sky since I was 15 when I got my first small DSLR camera, and I've continued and loved it ever since. Today I'm going to be sharing some background knowledge on the fundamentals of cameras and some tips and tricks to get you guys started on taking your own beautiful image of the, images of the night sky. So to get started, you guys are gonna need a few things. So you're gonna need a device to shoot with, a device stabilizer, and also your phone. So when choosing your, the device that you're gonna be shooting on, you have to know what you're looking for. And the most important qualities that you're looking for are the ability to change the shutter speed and the ISO of the camera. So what is shutter speed? Shutter speed or exposure is the length of time when the film or digital sensor inside the camera is exposed to light. Cameras have a shutter, which is a sort of flap that can be open for different amounts of time to let different amounts of light in the camera. So if you're taking an image at noon, when there's a lot of light coming into the camera at once, you're gonna need a really short shutter speed. But when you're taking images at night, you're gonna need a really long shutter speed to let as much light into the camera as possible. And so when you're looking at your camera, when you're setting uh, the shutter speed, it's going to be displayed in a in fractions of a second or seconds. So if it's under one second, you might see something like one two thousandths, which is one two thousandths of a second, which is a very short shutter speed. But if you have a longer shutter speed, it's going to show you a number and then an S. So you can see that um, it's seconds and not fractions of seconds. So you might see one second or five seconds or 30 seconds. And so for lower light conditions, you're gonna need a longer shutter speed. So um, we have an image up that will show us some different exposure times. So you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So you have to match your shutter to kind of match the lighting conditions that you're gonna be working in. So if you have a shutter speed that is too short, your image is gonna be underexposed and appear to be black. If you have a shutter speed that's open for too long, you're gonna have an overexposed image which will appear to be white. But if you find that happy medium right in the middle, you're gonna have a correctly exposed image, which is what we're going for. Since astrophotography needs to be um, as, the shutter speed needs to be as open as, as long as possible, it's actually longer than your camera knows to leave it open for on automatic settings. So you're gonna need control, manual control over your camera settings so it doesn't put the flash on and just make a black image. So you can do this on your phone with a little bit of help by downloading some apps. So personally, I have never taken uh, astrophotography images with my phone, but I did a little bit of research for you guys and found um, some apps that could be helpful. Nightcap, which is a $3 iOS app, Pro Camera, $5 iOS app, and HD Camera Pro, which is a $5 Android app. Like I said, I've never done this myself, but if you guys are able to take pictures in the night sky, I would let you guys can create and see what you can do with a, a, a phone camera. Um, I also know, I, I don't have a phone that does this, but I know some newer phones have a night mode setting on their camera where you can change the uh, exposure of your image between a half a second and two seconds. And this gives you some good images for like people or, or cars or something at night, but I still don't think that gives you enough control over the exposure for a good astrophotography image. But again, if you guys experiment and get something cool, please send it our way. We would love to see it. So another device that you guys can use is a point and shoot camera, which is a small digital camera and does a lot of um, its own stuff automatically. A lot of people have these, easy to come by. And you can change these um, cameras to manual mode. So they're easier to control than your phone. So there's a little dial on top of the camera that you can switch from automatic 
settings to the M setting, which is actually the manual setting to give you manually, to give you the ability to manually control the shutter speed and ISO of your camera. Um, same thing goes for DSLR cameras. So these are just more complex, um, basically better cameras than these point and shoot cameras, but um, you also want to change. So this is, yeah, an example of a DSLR camera, which is what I use. Um, but these also have a dial on top that you need to switch from automatic setting to the M manual setting to give you the control over the um, settings of your camera. So I also was mentioning ISO. So what is ISO? Let me That's talk about shutter question. speed. What is ISO? Yeah. What is it? So or ISO, ISO. <laughs> so ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. And it's displayed in numbers ranging from 100 to 6,400, depending on your cameras, uh, like how advanced your camera is. Um, in the simplest of explanations, increasing your ISO will brighten your photo and decreasing your ISO will darken your photo. But you have to be really careful. So it's really helpful to take images at night because it makes your photo brighter. But you have to be really careful because the higher your ISO, your Im image will become. So on the left here on the screen, you can see that uh, this black image is the lowest ISO setting. So it's very dark. And on the right, it's a really bright image. This is the highest ISO, but it's super, super grainy. So you got to find somewhere in the middle to find that happy medium. Um, so now that I've talked about shutter speed and ISO, does anyone have any questions on these two settings or choosing a device to use? I know it can be confusing. Yeah, there's definitely a whole lot of different things and it's a lot of trial and error. I know I've just started in my astrophotography uh, career or kind of a hobby and it is can be pretty frustrating for sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna move on to the next thing, the next setting that's crucial. Um, let me know if you guys any, have any. So um, the last setting that's really crucial to taking pictures at night is your aperture of your camera. Your phone camera and most point and shoot cameras don't give you the ability to control the aperture or also known as f-stop of a camera. So if you can't control this, don't worry about it, it's fine. <laughs> but if you do, I'm gonna give you some helpful info because it is important. So aperture refers to the opening of a camera's lens. So lower f-stops give you more exposure because they re represent larger apertures like you see on the top left corner here. It's really confusing. <laughs> The higher f-stop gives you less exposure because they represent smaller apertures, which is a smaller hole for your lens. I've been taking pictures for eight years and it's, I still have to think about it every time I do it. I know it's confusing. Um, so Jeremy and I were actually talking about this yesterday. So logically, you would think that you would use the um, lower f-stop to give you a larger lens to let in more light. But actually, the f-stop also controls your like where your camera is going to be focusing on in, in the um, field that it's, it's shooting in. So when you have a larger, a lower f-stop and a larger aperture, it's going to focus on subjects that are closer to the camera. So this is, is helpful for like people that are close to you or focusing on flowers that are close to you. A lesson but I had since, to learn the hard way. Yeah, sure. all of his pictures were blurry. <laughs> So you actually want to use the highest f-stop, which is your smallest aperture, because this is going to focus on the sub the furthest away from your camera, which is stars. So if you have the ability to change your f-stop, make sure it's always on the highest f-stop setting. Um, and it, it needs to stay on that to focus on the right thing. So Anyone have any questions yet before I move on to the next part? <laughs> I do, Sophie, about just f-stops, just because I've mm -hmm. been trying to figure that this out too. Is that only if you were, let's say we were, you were trying to take a long, really beautiful picture of just the Milky Way, would you still want to use a high f-stop number? Yep, yeah. So anytime you're shooting the stars, no matter what you're, you're focusing on, since the stars are really, really far away, you're always going to want to use the highest f-stop and slash smallest aperture. 
does that include for planets too? Since I know planets are quite a bit closer than the stars, but are they still far yep. enough away you want a, a high f-stop? Yeah. So anything that's even like mountains are far enough away that you'll always want to use a high f-stop. Anything that's really far away from your camera, you will you'll want to use a high f-stop for. Um, I see we have a question that has come in. So Christina. Krista, I think. Krista, I am sorry. Krista talked about uh, what type of camera she has, but no questions. I'm so sorry, I'm reading the wrong thing. <laughs> so a Samsung Galaxy. Um, you've been getting great astrophotography images recently through a telescope with your night mode. That is incredible. I actually didn't know that Samsung Galaxies did that. I'd love to see the images you have. Um, I would also love to hear from you if, were you putting your camera, your phone camera up to a telescope and shooting through the telescope or were you just using your camera lens um, as your lens? Would love to hear back from you on that. Um, until I hear back though, I'm gonna move on a little bit and I, I'd love to come back to this. So now that we talked about the settings of your camera and kind of getting to know your camera a little bit more uh, and you've chosen the device that you're using, now comes the planning. And astrophotography takes a good amount of prior planning. So first you're gonna to need to check the weather and make sure you're going to shoot on a night where the sky is clear, uh, the most basic thing. Colorado, it's pretty easy to find a night that's clear, but I'm from Massachusetts, there's a lot of cloudy nights, so you have to do more planning depending on where you are in the country. After you've made the sky, after you made sure the sky will be clear, you need to plan where you're gonna shoot the image and you need to plan what you're gonna take pictures of. So do you wanna take pictures of star trails or focus on a specific object? You could catch a flyby of the ISS or, or even the Milky Way. So each different object requires a little bit of different planning, but um, generally you need to figure out first where it's gonna be in the sky. Um, a helpful tool to use is a star tracking app to locate these objects. I use Night Sky, which is a free ISO iOS app, confusing to go back and forth between the two, uh, which is a free iOS app, but there are uh, hundreds of free star apps out there. So you guys can find uh, your own, the one that's best for you. Um, also, you need to make sure you're in a clearing or like a field that doesn't have tree coverage so you can see the objects in your sky. Um, again, easy to do in Colorado, but a little bit harder in places with more trees. And you also need to make sure you're in a place with not a lot of light pollution. Here in Colorado, you can drive about 30 minutes into the mountains to get even a beautiful view of the Milky Way with your naked eye and see a ton more stars and get a lot more beautiful images. Um, but again, if you're in another state um, that has a lot of light pollution, you're gonna need to do a little bit more research to figure out where you need to go to see the objects you're trying to take pictures of. Gotta do some planning. Yeah. Um, Milky Way, like I said, you just gotta make sure you can see it with your naked eye and you can get some beautiful images of, of it um, with not too much work. Uh, now, star trails, star trails are super cool. So when you're taking images of star trails, you're actually capturing the movement of the earth as it's turning. And our, to us, it seems like the stars are moving. It's just our view of the stars are changing. And you're capturing the trail of where the star is moving uh, while your shutter is open. Since the North Star is lined up with our Earth's axis, which doesn't move, our whole Earth rotates around the axis, um, the North Star doesn't move. It will always be in the same place in the sky, no matter the time of night or year. Uh, North Star is also called Polaris, but it's pretty cool to point your camera at the North Star and capture all these star like circles around the um, our northern axis. So I think it just makes really cool images. Um, so if you want to take pictures of the ISS flyby or any other um, flyby objects, I would recommend asking me questions and not trying that first or looking, doing a little bit more research because it is a little bit more complicated. Um, but to start a good place to start when taking pictures of the sky is taking images of planets that are just up in the sky because um, those are pretty easy. You just point your camera and shoot at it and do some experimentation. 
Um, I also see that Krista responded, um, a phone adapter from Celestron and an eyepiece. Yes, I will, um, Ramey, our question master, will give you a way to send over the images. And that is super cool. I've actually done some work with connecting my camera to a Celestron as well. So I'd love to talk more. It's cool using a telescope as your lens instead of a camera lens as a lens. Um, all right, anyone else have any questions before I move to the next thing? No, I think maybe let's, uh, let's keep on moving. Keep on trucking on here. Great, um, so after you set up your location and your spot of choice, you're gonna need to make sure you stabilize your camera because um, your hands always shake no matter what, um, even though you might think they're not shaking. So you need, oh, sorry, a uh, tripod or set your camera up on the ground or rocks or backpack, something to stabilize it because you're gonna get an image that looks like this. Um, your camera always captures movement while the shutter's open. So I'm gonna give you guys an example of a fair ride uh, with a short shutter speed. Um, this is the zipper, which actually turns around in a circle. And you can see with the short shutter speed, it just looks like it's stagnant or not moving. But when I take a picture of a long exposure of this zipper, it captures the movement of the zipper, um, the kind of like the movement of the stars, which is what star trails are. Um, so your camera will always capture any movement that goes on while your shutter is open, which is why you always want to stabilize your camera so it's not capturing the movement of your shaky hands. So after you set up your camera, you got to start experimenting. Astrophotography requires a lot of experimentation and messing with the camera setting to get the image to come out just right. There's no one recipe of settings that I can tell you that works because your, all of your settings are dependent on if you want to capture movement or where you are, the time of night, what you're shooting. It, it's so much that goes into it. You just got to experiment. And a good place to start is knowing if you want to capture movement in your image or not. So if you don't wanna capture movement, so if you wanna capture the stars just as they are, like this image here, I recommend you guys use a shutter speed below 30 seconds. If you wanna capture star trails, I would recommend using a shutter speed that's at least longer than five minutes, but can go up to a few hours um, to capture some good obvious star trails. And this image here was probably a few hours long actually. Um, I would avoid at all costs using a shutter speed that's between 30 seconds and five minutes because you're capturing the stars moving just a little bit, but not quite enough for you to know that it's a star trail. So your stars just appear blurry like this image here. Um, it took me a long time to figure out why all my images were appearing blurry, um, but this is why, so helpful tip. Um, now messing with your shutter speed again will mess up your exposure so, so you're not going to have that perfect exposure so you need to mess again with your iso um, and it's kind of a balancing act to level out the shutter speed and the iso where you take a picture look at it take a picture look at it change the settings until you're happy with how um, like perfectly exposed your image is, and you can see what you want to see on the camera uh, this becomes more difficult with longer exposures because you have to wait longer periods of time before you can see. Uh, but if you want to ask me more questions about um, some tips for long exposure, please let me know. I have uh, a lot of advice on that. Pack some snacks would be my tip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, definitely bring a cam uh, chair and also a friend to hang out while you wait for your uh, images to come out. Um, also, it's awesome to take images in a lowly light polluted area. Um, there's this image Jeremy is going to show you that is uh, an image I took in Massachusetts with a lot of light pollution. And you can see only a few stars, um, but it kind of came out. But like the image we looked at before, Star Trails, this is like no light pollution at all. And um, you can see you can, there are millions of more stars in this image. So. Closer to no light pollution, the more beautiful your image will become. Um, astrophotography can be really frustrating and difficult at times. You could spend hours um, shooting and get no good images, but 
when you get that one good image, it feels really, really good. And you have that image forever. And it feels awesome to be able to see this thing that you created um, and were able to show the beauty of the night sky um, in, in your own way through your own eyes. Um, and it takes a lot of effort and work. And even though um, you, like on a good night for me, I only get one to two good images. Um, but even though it's hard and it can be frustrating, um, it is definitely worth it. And you get to know the night sky more, you get to hang out outside, you get to um, get to know yourself and your camera more in the process. So it's hard, but definitely worth it. Yeah, I would just say definitely just stick with it. I mean, all these, uh, most of them were taken by either Sophie or myself, and all of them have something that's just a little bit off. Um, yeah. When you're out there, you know, you'll pick up on things and you get really close and you just, you kind of just have to fine tune it a little bit. And then, you know, you can start taking images like this uh, eclipse photo that uh, Sophie was able to create. Yeah. And this one took one was hours of taking images and also hours and hours of editing after the fact, just to put all the pictures together. But um, even though it took a long time, like that time seems pretty minuscule to how cool the picture came out and I've had it for so long and get to show it off uh, forever. So that's that's awesome. And like I said, you get to know the night sky so much more. It's, it's fun being outside mm -hmm. for hours. It gives you an excuse to be outside. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, we'll just kind of maybe open it up for questions here now. Yeah. If anybody has any um, specific questions or any like go backs, any things that maybe uh, you want yeah, us can, to elaborate on a little bit more. Yeah. Talk about more in depth. Happy to do that. I have some other tips I could give you guys. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Yeah. When you guys are maybe thinking of some... Uh, some ideas or maybe uh, questions you might have. I wanted to point out this center uh, photo. So many of you guys might've been paying to attention to the news of the comet Neowise that has been uh, coming by. Uh, it's closest approach to earth was on the 23rd, I believe. Um, but you can still get a pretty good image. This one right here on the kind of sandwich between the, the moon and the eclipse photo was taken just right off my back porch, actually, uh, I think three or four days ago. Um, so it's definitely still out there. Uh, if you look towards the northwest, towards the horizon, under the spoon of the dip, uh, Big Dipper, um, maybe you have to kind of scan the area a couple times until you see kind of just a faint little uh, cloud-looking type thing, and then you can kind of zoom in and uh, really fine-tune it with your camera. Um, we got a question from Bill Adams asking where the picture from behind came from. I believe it's the picture on the dome that Bill is talking about, which is actually just our uh, dome software. Correct, Jeremy? Um, Unless I mistakenly. I think he says, where, where did the picture behind Sophie come from? So I think he's talking oh, about behind you. My picture, sorry, yeah. I thought it was a dome. Um, my picture, this is actually, um, my dad has a telescope <laughs> that he has a solar filter to put on it and I have attached my DSLR camera to the telescope. So I used the telescope as the lens of the camera and pointed it at the sun um, and focused on a tree between the telescope and the sun. So the sun appears to be blurry and you can see the tree in detail. And so that's how this image came to be. It's actually the sun and a tree. It's just really, really up close. That's awesome. Yeah, for anybody out there listening, make sure you have a solar filter first. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't point go, your camera at the sun. It don't will do melt that. It and hurt your eye. Don't do it. Um, also, I forgot to mention this. Um, if you are taking a long exposure for 30 minutes or longer, it's really hard to experiment because you have to wait so long to see how the image came out. And it's like, maybe it'll come out just black. Um, so a good jumping off point for you guys is to set your ISO to 400 or below. Um, just, just, it's not going to work. It's not going to like guaranteed to work, but it's a good starting point because, um, you're going to have so much light coming in from a longer exposure, a lower ISO is better. Uh, I see we got another question from Bill Adams. Can you do a session on a daytime solar imaging? Um, like I, I believe what Bill's asking is, can you take an image of the sun? I don't, Jeremy, do you? 
have any input on it sounds like maybe he's asking if we could do a, like a, a dome to home video oh on, like, on solar specifically imaging. solar imaging i Which see i see i think um we definitely should. yeah that's a great idea bill Definitely. It's very, I'd say it's very different than taking images of the night sky because all of this information I gave you was taking pictures at night where all the settings are, have to be in the dark. But when you're taking pictures of the, of, uh, the sun during the day, it is very, very different. So we could do a whole daytime show on that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll note it down for the future. I know we've yeah. got, we've got lots of different ideas of shows we want to do, but I like that idea. That's a good one. Let's see, uh, any other questions, any other things you might want to talk about, Sophie? Um, I could also, let's see, I could go a little bit more in depth on uh, long exposure. So I'm going to give you guys another hint or a tip, sorry, on um, when you're taking long exposure images. So like we talked about, your camera captures any movement or anything that happens while um, your shutter is open. So you have to be really careful about what you do while your shutter is open. So I always make sure I don't walk close to my camera because that will shake the tripod and shake the camera. And then your camera is going to capture that movement. Um, so you got to stay away from your camera and also don't shine lights because your camera will pick up those lights unless you're trying to be really artsy. Um, but don't shine lights. Um, another tip if you guys have a camera that has the ability to either be connected to a remote control um, or your phone, like through an app, my camera does this. Um, you should shut your shutter off remotely because when you touch your camera, it will shake the camera um, because you're gonna be needing to use a bulb setting, which, so you'll have to manually shut off your camera settings instead of like automatic timer on the camera because cameras don't know to do shutters longer than 30 seconds. Um, also, you're gonna have to set a timer on your phone. So you're knowing how long to shut the, sh after how long to leave the shutter open before you shut it off um, because your camera's not gonna do it automatically. Cause you're, since this is all manually done, um, cameras aren't built for this. It's all, uh, you're making it even more manual when you're doing longer exposures. All right, uh, Krista looks like she loves your eclipse photos and is a great comet picture. Thanks, Krista. Thanks, Krista. If only you I can't saw... wait to see yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm excited too. If you only you saw how many photos I had to take to get that one image. <laughs> oh, oh, same. All goodness. of these have <laughs> thousands of other photos that were terrible yeah. <laughs> before and after. Yep. Um. Yeah, I think if that's maybe all the questions that maybe are coming in um, might be a good place to, to wrap it up for the day. Uh, once again, guys, thank you so much uh, for coming out and supporting us at Fisk and thanks for tuning in. Uh, yeah. If you guys keep tuning in, we'll keep putting out videos like this. So um, you guys are the, the real reason why we do everything. And Sophie, thanks for all the uh, helpful tips and information on astrophotography today. Of course. Also, just wanted to say, if you want to get out there and try, the uh, Perseid meteor shower is going to be on August 13th. Great time to try to start taking images of the night sky. And thank you guys for having me. And um, I hope that you guys reach out with any more questions about this stuff. Love to answer them. All right. Until next time, guys. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Only other thing. Uh, Fisk is doing lots of different virtual um new or we're putting out lots of new virtual products so as you guys know we have this dome to home series um we also have started a podcast called a view from earth um so if you guys just go we're available on i think itunes hopefully maybe itunes uh soundcloud um and there's links and everything like that if you go to fiskplanetarium.com uh, our website um uh with that we'll be here same time next week um uh, Oh yeah, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud. There we go. That's where you can find the, the podcast. Um, until next time, guys, thank you all so much. Take care. <laughs>